great. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our first webinar of our 12 month series. Um, Anthem Memory Care has 16 communities um, covering six states across the United States, all wow. joining us tonight. Um, our so program good. will be recorded and can be found on our Anthem YouTube channel in the upcoming week. Uh, please keep your microphones muted until our Q&A session of, of the webinar, at which time you can then turn on your cameras and your oh, microphones, God. obviously, uh, to I'm ask any questions. And if we do experience some background noise during this time, uh, we will be muting it um, on our end. So no hard feelings if we, if we mute you during the, the uh, presentation. Record and transcribe. We need to do here. Settings. Briefly. Accessibility device settings. Noise suppressing video, <laughs> near my video, camera, noise suppression, microphone, speaker. I think I found that oh, one. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, Tam, we you break. are not, Tam, you are still muted. You need to unmute your microphone. Wow, I feel like I've been chastised. I've been muted. <laughs> You're back. <laughs> We're back. back. Okay. Let's, let's do a couple of things here and get this yeah. Yeah, get show on the road. So okay. let me, yeah, let me, I'll be, let me, let me introduce you. Let me introduce you to everyone here, uh, Tam. So uh, we bring to you tonight, everyone, a legend in dementia training, Dr. Tam Cummings. Um, Dr. Tam, as she is known in the dementia community, is a uh, practicing gerontologist who has devoted her professional uh, career to educating both professionals and family caregivers. In 2009, she founded the Dementia Association with the mission to inspire, educate, and empower dementia caregivers. At Anthem, we utilize her transformative work, including the Itty Bitty Dementia book in our daily conversations with families of those with dementia. You may have already received your copy of the Itty Bitty Dementia book from your local Anthem community, and if not, it is available uh, for purchase on Amazon. So, families, professionals, and caregivers, it is an honor to present to you Dr. Tam. Thank you so much, Chris and Jamie. Thank you guys for doing this. I am so very excited to be working with Anthem Memory Care. Anytime I can find a group of medical professionals who want to do a better job in dementia care for our loved ones, it is very, very exciting. And so I am very excited to be doing this. I'm, I'm really thrilled for y'all to be following us. I'm so glad for the technology that we can put this up so that you can share it with family members so you can go back and watch pieces again. And at the end of today, you should have a much better understanding of what is going on with your loved one. Now, as we go through this series, at the start of each session, I'm going to give you a stress relieving tip. And it's not something that says you need to go on a vacation because that's probably not realistic. It's something that within a minute or so will help you calm yourself because being a caregiver is extremely stressful. So what I want you to know is Greenstone's awesome icebreaker. And Jamie, this is something that I tell families to use when you are simply feeling overwhelmed. And what happens is, Computers have actually been designed to work the way we think the human brain works. And so your brain begins to open window after window after window. And as you begin to think coulda, woulda, shoulda, that's living in the past, that leads to depression. What if, what if, what if, that's common in dementia is what's gonna happen next. That opens up more windows, that's anxiety. And you finally reach a point where your brain can't open any more windows and you feel yourself stuck. So go to the freezer, get out a piece of ice, put it in your hand, walk over to the sink, squeeze the ice tightly in your hand, shut your eyes and breathe. When you mm -hmm. get to the seventh breath, your brain is freaking out because the brain's secondary thing is to monitor the body systems. That's what it's supposed to be doing. And all of a sudden you've put something in your hand that's freezing and freezing means burning. 
but it's also cold, drippy, and wet. And your brain begins to shut down all of those windows of worry and concern and anxiety. And all of a sudden, drop the ice on about your seventh breath, continue to breathe through 10 breaths, and you'll feel yourself calm down. And Jamie, I have actually pulled off the side of the road, walked in a convenience store, got a handful of ice out of the ice machine and stood there, took 10 deep breaths, dropped my ice and walked back out. And I'm pretty sure to this day, they're still talking about that. So take a picture of the screen if you need to. Um, this is in your itty bitty dementia book, but this will calm you down. And my biggest fear is that you don't remember to do it. So try to remember to do the icebreaker. The next thing, Jamie, is something that you and Chris and I have run into throughout our careers. Families leave their medical professional, whether it's a primary care physician or even whether it's a neurologist specializing in dementia with no understanding or conversation that the diagnosis your loved one was just given is a terminal diagnosis. And that's what I see all over the country. And I'm sure it's what y'all see. I think of y'all as being up north. As y'all uh, see up there, is that not true? That is absolutely the case, unfortunately. And to me, that is such a, a disservice that's done to families because if they had been given that knowledge and time, they'd be able mm -hmm. to make better preparations, right? That's right. Be able to plan better financially for what's mm -hmm. going to happen and, and be able to understand this person's not doing this on purpose. They have a terminal disease of the brain. And it 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 bothers me that we don't do a better job of, of saying this. Uh, this year, or actually two years ago, the name of dementia was changed from dementia to major neurocognitive disorder. And Jamie, which one sounds scarier, major neurocognitive disorder or dementia? Um, the latter. <laughs> but which one sounds like it could be something really serious? major neurocognitive yeah. disorder. But even then, even with all the work that went into coming up with the new name for dementia, nowhere in there did it say terminal. And so families are frequently caught completely off guard. Now, families frequently are noticing things. One of the big things that Nicole and I hear, Chris and I hear, Jamie and I hear, every professional I know hears, is that the family's in denial. The family's not paying attention. The children are in denial. And I always say, no, I, I don't really think they're in denial. I think they need more education. Or they have noticed these subtle, different changes, and they can't quite put the pieces together. And the person recovers so quickly, Jamie, when they, when they do notice that, that something is wrong, the person very quickly recovers. So as a family caregiver, you may have noticed that there's difficulty with finances and that there is a change. The mortgage got paid multiple times. The mortgage didn't get paid at all. Your loved one believes the bank is actually an illegal thing that they're trying to do some activity on this person. And so they're not going to pay their bills. You may see a subtle change in personality or a very distinctive change in personalities, which is a, a clue because for the most part, dementias don't cause somebody's personality to change. It may enhance it, but if there's a major change in personality, that's a clue that something's not right. Mm -hmm. Forgetting to pay the electric bill, a lady that I talked to yesterday said their first clue was that her father, who'd always been the financial person, uh, she got to the house and picked up the mail as she came into her parents' house and there was a cutoff notice for the electricity. And his response was he would go down there and yell at them. And then they would say, well, here's what you really owe because they were trying to get him. And so you saw this paranoia, but the daughter couldn't put it all together. She just knew dad was behaving differently. A big thing for families is their loved one gets. Oop, you were you were muted, Tim. Not sure how that happened to you, Tim.
You're back. There you go. It it says somebody keeps muting me. So whoever's doing that, cut that out. <laughs> okay. So I'm not talking about getting lost at, at Walmart because they rearranged all the aisles last night to mess with us. I'm talking about your loved one was always the driver on the vacation. This is a city they've been to multiple times that, that getting lost has never been in their, it's just never been part of their life. They, they've always been able to find their way around mm -hmm. or the family notices on a cruise and they've always loved to take cruises. That's their thing that now the cruise is not fun, that the person is getting lost. They're not enjoying it. Things happen on the computer and I cannot stress enough how you, the person who does not have brain damage, must secure your passwords, your finances, your computer, your iPads, because without meaning to, your loved one can literally get rid of every dime you have. You can go back and tell me that on this day, mama started acting differently. Well, the only dementia that causes that to happen is vascular dementia. It means that there's been a stroke. It's, it's something that's that specific. Or you can go back and name the decade. Because a lot of times, Jamie, what people will tell me is that dementia started three months ago. Mm -hmm. And that's just not possible. It's too subtle. By the time they call you and me, dementia has probably been in place at least 10 years. It's just so slow and subtle. Odd things that may happen is your mother, who would never call you at work because it's work and work is serious, your mother calls you at work repeatedly and doesn't seem to realize that she's called you. Yep. And Jamie, in your gut, you feel that something's wrong and you need to trust your gut. You're worried for a reason. You may not have a name for it, but you're worried. Other things to watch out for are risky behavior, sudden increase in spending or, or drinking. I know somebody who the forensic a CPA person found $8 million is what we could find that was missing that had gone to another country for a girlfriend that didn't exist. I have seen somebody lose every dime they had uh, because they didn't understand what money was anymore. Or a strange dementia where the sign that the dementia has started is a sudden increase in interest in drinking. But Jamie, it makes no sense. The person hides their liquor bottles under the pillow in the bed they share with their spouse. That's not a very good hiding place. Or they get picked up for shoplifting because they walk into a liquor store, open a bottle and drink it, and then set it down and walk out. Somebody who doesn't recognize that there are risk around them. You find out that your mother's been letting strangers in her house at two in the morning. Or she's up cooking for a cat at two in the morning that doesn't exist and she has gas burners. A sudden lack of interest in assets or family members, even being angry at, at family members, changing the powers of attorney. And you have to be careful. And y'all, Jamie, because y'all cover so many states, families need to be aware that a POA in Texas is not valid in Oklahoma. A POA in Minnesota is not valid in Ohio. It has to be made in the state that the person resides in. The computer is very dangerous. The computer can bring bad people to your house to, to get money from your loved one. The computer can make your loved one click on something and suddenly your accounts are empty. And another very odd thing that happens, Jamie, is this is one of the signs of a frontal temporal dementia, which is a younger person's dementia. They are 55 to 60 and they come home and tell their family, I quit my job today, just tired of it and I can't do it anymore. So you may have seen signs that didn't quite make sense to you. Other signs are things like they begin to attack their favorite child. And Jamie, this is devastating. You've seen this, Chris, you've yes. seen this. The, the favorite child is devastated because they've never been in trouble for anything. And I can say that because I'm not the favorite child and I have a baby brother and a baby sister. So, you know, I, I, I see it. And what I try to tell the family member is they're throwing themselves at the rock and you're their rock. And that's how you try to deal with this because it's devastating to suddenly be attacked and 
as part of being attacked to be accused of stealing, especially, Jamie, when all the family member is trying to do is secure money, secure care, make sure care is there, make sure proper care is given, make sure they're in the proper place. And instead, they get accused of stealing the house, stealing the car, stealing the money, stealing the medicine, stealing the purse, the wallet, the phone. Everything is being stolen. Now, Jamie, you and I have heard this always. But because of our profession, because we know this is part of dementia, we still have to listen with one good ear because in my career, I certainly have had to call Adult Protective Services because there is somebody in the family stealing or doing something they shouldn't be doing. But primarily, that accusation of theft that you may be horribly embarrassed by is a sign of the disease. What's interesting is in Lewy body dementia, that accusation of stealing by the family happens in stage three of the disease. In the other dementias, that is much more of a stage five behavior. Mm -hmm. Dementias can cause sudden crashing depression, especially Lewy body dementias and Parkinson's disease dementias. The brain suddenly seems to stop being able to use serotonin correctly. In other dementias, they see things. And specifically for one dementia, they may see children, they may see bugs, spiders, rats, and snakes. They may see bad people coming to get them. And Jamie, that can include a family member, which means that family member may not be able to visit until these hallucinations stop. And the fourth hallucination is that the person sees their spouse or their caregiver having sex with everyone everywhere. And the family can be so embarrassed by that last one that they don't tell the doctor, they don't tell us, and that particular set of four hallucinations are part of the clinical features of a dementia called Lewy body's dementia. Your person may begin to nap and they may begin to nap a lot. And the way they nap, Jamie, families don't realize it, the way they nap is even a clue to the type of dementia that a person has. So all of these behaviors mean something it just doesn't mean everybody has Alzheimer's. And Alzheimer's dementia looks much different than a vascular dementia or a Lewy body dementia. Families can also miss signs of, of things that are going on, and then they're too embarrassed to talk about it, to tell us about it. And we're prepared to support you and say, you need to take that computer away. Jamie, I have had a family that got very upset with grandpa because grandpa was now a porn addict and all grandpa had done was try to post on a Facebook page that his kitty cat was missing. And it doesn't take much on the internet to light up porn and apparently kitty cat or cat will, will do that. And I know that you've seen that too and yes. families are, are embarrassed to discuss it. We have. And I, I just try to explain to them it, it, it's a normal thing that happens. For one thing, a comedian has already said, we need to quit making porn. We've got enough. Nobody needs to do anymore. But the other is that your person didn't do this on purpose. They typed in an innocent word. And because of how computer systems work, suddenly they're now getting emails and all sorts of other things. And that can cause the family not to seek help, not to seek care. And it puts more stress on them. There's also things that are very easy to be missed. I knew a man once who was the publisher of a well-known uh, national magazine, and he was hilarious. He, he was known for his humor, and he had this very particular funny chuckle laugh he would make, and he had been doing it to his children since they were babies. And when he did it, he would sort of goose them, and he would do this very, very humorous chuckle. And when I met the family, I realized that none of his brilliant, highly educated, very smart children understood that every time their father laughed, he didn't think what they were doing was funny. He wasn't trying to be funny. He was using a social trick, a social skill, because he no longer understood where the conversation was. And so frequently we see families miss something because of the love and the emotion that they have for this person. Whereas to you or to me, it is very apparent that this is not a ha ha ha, I'm really having a great day chuckle. This is actually a chuckle that you and I do when we're lost in a conversation in a public setting. 
there can be changes sexually that occur. And because none of us want to talk about anybody else's sex life and certainly not our parents, that gets missed when it's information that the doctor needs because certain sexual behaviors or sexual changes are indicators of forms of dementia. Your person may behave different socially. Somebody who has always been the best guest at a restaurant suddenly screams at the waitress or has, has an anger or tantrum or a fit in a restaurant and something you've, you've never seen before. You can have trouble because we're blended families. It's no longer that nuclear family. Your, your loved one may have had multiple marriages. There may be more confusion. There may be a great deal of interest from the stepchildren. There may be no interest or involvement by the stepchildren. Sadly, medical professionals don't follow protocol. And, and Nicole, or, I'm sorry, Jamie, let me give you an example of this. If I went to my primary care physician and I said my big toe hurts, I'd get sent to a podiatrist. And if I went and I said I've got this spot on my skin, I'd be referred to a dermatologist. If I said my heart feels funny, I feel like I can't catch my breath, I get dizzy, I'd go off to a, to a cardiologist. But if I say to a primary care physician, I'm having trouble with my memory, too many times the response is, oh, well, if you know that, you don't have a problem. And that's actually the opposite. If you think you're having memory issues, that's not normal. You need to be seen and tested properly. And the person is not sent on the correct medical protocol, which is to be tested and the testing sequence is about 28 different tests. It's not the mini mental status exam. It's a series of cognitive tests, as well as an MRI, a PET scan, a SPECT scan, an EEG, an EKG. And so because this protocol doesn't get followed, our families don't get their person diagnosed soon enough or diagnosed with the correct type of dementia that the person has. And frequently the spouse who knows this person better than anyone else, their opinion, their concern gets brushed aside. And Jamie, I know that just like me, you have had multiple family members tell you that the doctor told them there's nothing wrong with your husband, but you ma'am need therapy. And as it turned out, there was something wrong with her husband and she didn't need therapy. Have you seen that happen? Oh, absolutely. So frustrating for these families. It's it's heartbreaking for them, especially when you find out that they've been trying so many times for several years to get mm -hmm. someone to look at their loved one. And the horrible thing was that person could have been on the medication. And instead, by the time they do get seen, it, it's usually too late. The other thing is that they're not giving the correct test. The test is the slums test, St. Louis University Mental Status Exam or the MOCA test, the Montreal test. These are tests that measure cognition and are so sensitive that they actually identify stage two of the disease process. Otherwise, the MMSE doesn't identify anything's wrong until stage five, and that's significantly different. Now, another thing that I run into with families is they don't seem to understand that dementia doesn't care about your loved one. It doesn't care what their job was, what their intellect was, whether they were a person who gave to others, whether they were mean and nasty and selfish. They, dementia doesn't care. Families will say, but, but he's so healthy. No, he just looks healthy on the outside. He hasn't reached stage six. In stage six, he'll lose one third to one half of his body weight. Not because we don't care, but because it's a brain disease. Or he suddenly started drinking, and that's a sign of behavioral variant FTD. Or he doesn't appear to love us, his family, anymore. That's also a sign of behavioral variant FTD. They're all signs of brain damage. But at the end of the day, dementia doesn't care what you did. It is a disease of the brain. One thing that is a clue is the age of the person. Another thing is the sex of the person and most critically is the behavior of the person. And the reason why we need to know the behavior is because of a term called anosognosia. It means the inability of the brain to recognize that the brain is damaged. 
Your loved one is not in denial. Your loved one's brain is simply not able to register or recognize that they've already asked you that question. Because of brain damage, the brain doesn't know that you've already told us that answer. Instead, they think you're being mean, you're being nasty, and every time you correct someone, you only make them matter. And I had a grandmother, uh, Jamie, that would say, you can get happy in the same clothes you got unhappy in. People with dementia can't do that. If I upset a person with dementia, and remember, Jamie, they pick up on my attitude. If I come to work in a bad mood, I'm going to make everybody in dementia care unhappy. Because once one person's unhappy, it, it spreads to everybody else. But people with dementia can't get happy right away. It usually takes sleep and overnight. So I've got to always make sure that my attitude is the correct attitude as I come to work that day. Yeah. Being paranoid is part of the disease process. If the world around you doesn't make sense anymore because you have brain damage, you're going to naturally get a little paranoid. And because the brain can't tell me that I'm doing something incorrect, instead my brain tells me what it thinks I, I need to know, which is I've always put my purse here. This is where I put my purse. I know my purse is here. And now I can't find my purse, Jamie, but you're here. And you know, Jamie, now that I think about it, you've always appeared suspicious to me like you were up to no good. And so I accuse you of stealing my purse. Now I'm ugly to you and I hurt your feelings and you leave and go home. And what you don't realize is I'm up all night long. There's a reason it's called the 36 hour day. At three in the morning, I find my purse in the freezer and I don't think, oh, I should be ashamed. I yelled at Jamie and said, you stole my purse and here it is in the freezer. Instead, the brain thinks, oh, how sneaky Jamie is. She hid my purse in the freezer. I better go hide my purse before she comes again. And the disease starts all over again. The game starts again. And what is so, I think, difficult for families, for medical professionals, for friends at church and synagogue, for our neighbors, is that people with dementia don't look sick until the very end of the disease. And, and families think, well, if, if they were really sick, they would look sick. Stigma of dementia stops people from seeking help. And because of how our medical system is set up, because dementia is so subtle, our medical professional misses it. And it could be something as subtle, Jamie, as you've noticed that there's a vacancy in the eyes that comes and then goes. And then as the disease progresses, the vacancy is there longer and longer. And because of the stigma and because our medical professionals don't follow the protocol that they should be following, we don't get people diagnosed until stage five of the disease. And by then the disease has done significant damage. And we need people diagnosed much sooner than that. Now, Jamie, I know this is something you and Chris both know. By the time you and I meet the person with dementia and their family caregiver, which one actually looks more ill? Jamie, is it the person with the terminal brain disease or is it the family caregiver? Well, often it's the caregiver. They're just so exhausted. It, they, they, they are. The death for the caregiver occurs not because of their own comorbidities, their own illnesses they might have. It occurs because of the stress not understanding what's happening to their loved one, and it occurs because of the amount of work they're doing. By stage five of the disease, they are doing the work of 12 professional caregivers in one of your communities. By stage six or stage seven, which is the bedbound stage, the family caregiver is doing the work of 16 professionals, and that level and amount of work is what causes their death. We also tend to overlook that this person usually is going to have anxiety. How could you not have anxiety? They're typically going to have depression. They're watching their loved ones slowly die and they're having bit by bit to take away the things that make you and I independent. How could they not have depression? May not be aware of the financial risk. I ran into someone last week and she said, my dad always did the finances, so mom never thought to question him. And by the time somebody questioned him, there was no more finances left. He had lost everything. And 
because of the stress, the family caregiver, we now recognize and understand also develops compassion fatigues, secondary traumatic stress disorder. The same thing that professional caregivers develop, the same thing that first responders develop, the family caregiver gets as well. And because of that, even though Jamie knows what she's doing, Chris knows what he's doing, I know what I'm doing, and we're telling you it's time to move your loved one to care, you look at us and go, yeah, we'll do that later. And you don't realize the reason for care is that your loved one has a terminal disease and needs care, but if you don't get assistance, you're not going to be the survivor of the disease. You have to remember that until stage six, the person with dementia does not look sick. Now, this is a, is a picture of Bruce Willis, and Bruce Willis has been, been identified with one of the frontal temporal dementia primary progressive aphasia uh, domains. But what I had noticed, I'm a big Bruce Willis fan. I've, I've always liked his stuff. I find him to be just such a funny guy. But what I had noticed is in the movie Red, where he's retired, extremely dangerous. It's the CIA, retired CIA people. Um, and it's a comedy. But what I noticed when I watched it was that he had gone from being this very verbose, talkative actor to he had very few lines and his lines had only a few words. And I began to suspect then that something was seriously happening to Mr. Willis because his presentation in that movie was so much different. But it's not at all unusual that people would miss something being wrong with their loved one because humans assume if you're sick, you look sick, and in all other illnesses you do, except for dementia. People with dementia don't look sick until stage six of the disease. Jamie, they have to lose an entire pound of brain tissue. They still have good social skills because social skills started the day you and I were born. Your hand was shaken. People told you hello. When you left the hospital, they held you up, and waved your little hand and said goodbye to the nurses and the doctors. So you and I have good social skills. People in stage six still have good social skills. They just can't start them. That's why when you walk into memory care, everybody's sitting at the table having breakfast. They turn and look at you, but nobody does anything till you start the social skill. And once you start that, then everybody's going to wave back mm -hmm. at you. People with dementia are not aware of time. So if you need to do a respite stay, respite stays are things that can help you tremendously. Your loved one goes into the community for two to three weeks and you're able to catch up on sleep, go to a graduation, go see a grandchild you haven't seen, go on vacation with your friends. They are especially not aware of any odd behaviors. So if you point out their odd behaviors, you're not going to make them happy. You're just going to make them frustrated and angry with you, suspicious and annoyed. Stage six is where the term 36 hour day comes from, because this is where the person can begin to stay awake and in motion and in movement for 36 to 72 hours at a time. This is where they lose one third to one half of their body weight. Families are not aware that that person that looks so healthy is actually very frail and very fragile. People with dementia are six times more likely to break bone than normal aging elderly, and we anticipate that broken bone in stage six of the disease. They develop urinary tract infections, their body temperature is lower, and there's great language and loss of ability to track and understand sound in this stage and that's when they finally look sick. Children can become so focused on the obviously ill parent that they miss that the other parent may also be ill. Or they notice that something is wrong with their mother and they cannot get their father to discuss a plan of care for them. And so it can be very frustrating. Have you seen that, Jamie? We absolutely do see that and try to help as much as we can. And it is literally the elephant in the room. And, and what's so frustrating is if it was cancer, we would have such a different plan set up and the family would be able to know what we need to do. So when I meet families, Jamie, one of the first things they ask me is, why do we need to know which dementia a person has? And it's because it tells us everything to plan for care. The type of dementia a person has is now part of your children and grandchildren's medical history. The same way my grandfather, my maternal grandfather's oat cell carcinoma lung cancer 
is part of my medical history. I don't smoke roll your own bull Durham, but I still have a maternal grandfather with a cancer history. The type of dementia tells us how much time this person has left, literally. The type of dementia tells us the type of care this person will need. Some dementias must be cared for in a skilled setting. Most dementias can be cared for in a memory care setting. The type of dementia tells us how the disease will progress and what to expect next. The type of dementia tells us which staging tool to, to use. The type of dementia tells us whether or not medications should be used or which medications should be used. And the type of dementia tells us what kind of behaviors this person will display during the course of this disease because it's brain damage. And Jamie, if I damaged your brain the same way somebody with behavioral variant frontal temporal dementia, the way their brain is damaged, you'd behave the very same way. It's brain damage, but we need to know which one. You need to know which one because the financial and the medical risk are very, very real. I know families who have stolen assets. I know of caregivers who have stolen assets. I know of a person with dementia who every day gave away several thousand dollars until $600,000 was missing. There are online scams that target older people, that target people with dementia. And if you'll think about it, the Amber Alert system is used more for dementia than it is for children. So when I want to explain cancer or dementia to a family, or I want to help a family be able to explain it to their children, I make a comparison to cancer. And the reason is that you and I have been taught to think about cancer and to understand cancer differently. So cancer is an umbrella term. It's talking about one of 438 identified diseases of the brain. They mean it, it by itself, cancer means that cells of the body have gone astray and are attacking the body. Dementia is an umbrella term. It's not the name of anything. It's the overall term for a group of 128 identified diseases of the brain. 70 of those diseases are called child, children's Alzheimer's. And of the remaining set, about nine of them are 98% of all the dementias, and that's primarily what we focus on. So dementia, if that's what you've been told your loved one has, is no, no different than telling you they have cancer. The difference is, if the doctor had said the word cancer, you would have known the right questions to ask. So Jamie, as we look at the cancer family caregiver and the dementia family caregiver, the cancer family caregiver is a caregiver for about two years. The dementia family caregiver, before they meet you, before they meet Chris, before they meet me, has been a caregiver for at least 10 years. In cancer, you understood there were subsets. You understood to ask a whole bunch of questions. You actually have about 30 questions you've been trained to ask if the word is cancer. And now you know those are the same questions to ask if the word is dementia. In the cancer, there's always a miracle. Everybody knows somebody that was supposed to die six years ago and hasn't. In dementia, there is no miracle. The only thing that will possibly feel like a miracle is most people with dementia will die in stage five or stage six of the disease. Only a small percentage will live to the bed bound stage or stage seven. In cancer, when the person with cancer dies, the families report little to no measurable levels of guilt. And Jamie, when they're asked why, they say we did everything the doctor said to do. When the dementia person dies, the families have huge levels of guilt. And the number one answer they give is, I didn't do enough. And yet I know the day I meet them, that that person has been doing care for at least 10 years. And they've been doing it without the answers, without the support, without all of the things that are put in place if the diagnosis is cancer. Does that make sense, Jamie? It, yes, it really does. Okay, now the names of the dementias actually mean something. They're the name of the doctor. Alzheimer, Pix, Parkinson, Huntington, Wernicke, Korsakoff, Crutzfield, Jakob, Newman, Barr, uh, Louis. I think that's about it. Uh, they're named for areas of the brain. Frontal temporal dementias are in the frontal temporal lobes. They're named for the cause. Now this is a trick question, Jamie, but the cause of vascular dementia is something vascular kind of a trick. It's something vascular. Or the name is giving you the outcome. Primary progressive aphasia. 
the main course of this dementia, it only gets worse, is the inability to use and understand language until death occurs. The people that you see here, this is Alice Alzheimer and Augusta Dieter. Augusta Dieter is the woman that Alzheimer's named the disease for. And she was brought into his hospital. She was 56 years old and her family said she had fits of rage and jealousy. She had moments where she didn't seem to know or recognize her husband or her children. She didn't recognize her home or her neighborhood where she'd lived her whole life. This is the only known picture taken of her. And when you ask people how old she looks in this photograph, I'm usually told somebody in their late 80s or their, or their 90s. She's actually 57 in this photograph. This is the only picture taken of her. Uh, I'm sorry, she's 56 in this photograph, and she died about a year after this. Dr. Alzheimer ordered her increased diet. He ordered increased exercise. He ordered a daily spa and bath massage because this was Germany. And in spite of everything they did, she continued to decline. When she died, he autopsied her brain. He wrote a paper about what he found. And those four things, the brain had shrunk. The brain was full of cerebral spinal fluid. The brain cells themselves were heavily damaged and had tangled and the brain had bone plaque growing in it. Those four things are the features today of what is called Alzheimer's disease. And these are some of the other physicians that are responsible for naming dementias. I just put that in there because it's in the test later. So now these are the five questions that you need to know the answer to. Which dementia does your loved one have? Do you understand that their brain is dying? Has your loved one started falling yet? And yet, Jamie, means everybody with dementia falls. Has your loved one had a UTI yet? And yet means everybody with dementia develops urinary tract infections. It's due to brain damage. And how is your guilt as a family caregiver? And those are things that we want to be able to help you with. So these are the nine most common forms of, of dementia, Jamie. And while I cannot make a diagnosis for you, I can teach you how to do what a physician does. To make any diagnosis, a doctor takes the person's age, sex, and clinical features and then takes away everything that it cannot be. And what you're left with is what it must be. So I can't make your diagnosis tonight, but I'll show you how I use my mother and father to help you know what to do with this slide. So first of all, I'm gonna do my 83 year old mother and I'm gonna start with number nine and I'm gonna rule out the dementias that I know my mother cannot have. My mother never played football a day in her life. I can take off number nine, that is football dementia. My family does not have Huntington's. Huntington's is inherited. My mother would have died decades ago. I can take off Huntington's. Wernicke Korsakoff is commonly called alcohol dementia, and my mother's actually never had a drink of alcohol in her life. If I can take that one off. She doesn't have Parkinson's disease, and if she doesn't have Parkinson's disease, Jamie, she can't have Parkinson's disease dementia, so I can take that one off. Frontal temporal dementias, these are dementias that we are taught, Jamie, if the person is younger than the age of 65, Instead of thinking early onset Alzheimer's, our first thought should be rule out frontal temporal dementias. These are dementias of much younger adults, so I can take that one off. My mother doesn't have any of those four hallucinations. She doesn't see children. She doesn't see bug spiders, rats, or snakes. She doesn't see bad people coming to get her. She doesn't see anybody having sex. She also doesn't kick or punch in her sleep. And she also doesn't have unexplained constipation or sudden loss of consciousness. So I can take number four off. But my mother gets pneumonia at least three times a year. My mother grew up with a smoker. My mother married a smoker. My mother has obesity and cellulitis, hyperlipidemia, high cholesterol. She's had a couple of documented strokes. She has AFib. All of those things are cardiovascular. So I'm going to make a check next to number three for vascular. And then in the 80s, the odds are one in six of developing late onset Alzheimer's. And if some other dementia is already in place, Jamie, we know Alzheimer's will join it. So for my mother, I go back to the doctor to ask about number three, number two, and a combination of those would be a mixed dementia. 
but let's do daddy. Daddy's a little more exciting. My father was actually the high school quarterback who led the Evant high school football team, which was a six-man football team, to the state championship in 1956. Now, six-man football, Jamie, means that the town is so small they can only field six boys on the team, and those boys play play both offense and defense. So it's a lot of running, not that much tackling, but I still need to let the doctor know that. My family doesn't have Huntington's, so I can take that one off. Now, you know I said my mother didn't drink, Jamie. Wh which parent do you think might have been drinking? Maybe your dad. And maybe. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not talking about your, your husband mowed the lawn and he had a beer while he watched the ball game. And I'm not talking about, Jamie, you went out with your friends and y'all had a glass of rosé. I'm talking a case of beer and a bottle of whiskey a day. So somebody drinking at that level, we anticipate the development of a brain disease, dementia that's related to alcohol. And so even though my father's been sober for three decades, for three decades, he wasn't sober. So I'm going to make a check next to number seven as well. He doesn't have Parkinson's disease, so he can't have Parkinson's disease dementia. At 87, he's much too old for FTD, so I can mark that one out. He doesn't have those hallucinations or kicking and punching in his sleep. I can mark that one out. But Jamie, for every cold beer in this hand, what did Jim have in this hand, do you think? He was a smoker. He had him an unfiltered Paul Mall cigarette, the real cigarettes, not those fake filtered ones, the real ones. And when they said, Jim, cigarettes are bad, he went, oh, cigars. And when they said, Jim, cigars still bad, he went, oh, chewing tobacco. So we're not making a whole lot of progress there. He was a smoker. His mother was a smoker. And I'm pretty sure my father was smoking at about the age of six. And my father is about this big around and has high cholesterol and that yells stroke activity. So I'm gonna make a check next to number three. At 87, he's closer and closer to his 90s where the odds are one and two of late onset Alzheimer's and he's done some damage to his brain in his lifetime. So I'm gonna make a check next to number two as well. So for my father, I go back to the doctor to ask about number nine, number seven, number three, number two, number one. And so what families need to understand is your person can easily have more than one form of dementia. Now you need to understand that the brain runs the body and the brain doesn't care if your loved one was an Olympic athlete. It doesn't care. The brain is dying. If it's Alzheimer's dementia, then neurons are dying because of failing proteins, which cause the roots of the neurons to tangle and crumble. And that means that the cell can't take in nutrition from the blood supply, so the cell starves, dies, and is removed from the body in waste. Sleep apnea, COPD, smoking, um, cholesterol, strokes, cardiovascular events, those things are all causing damage and death to the brain. And then alcohol, whose technical name is neurotoxin, and if you translate neurotoxin, it means brain poison, uh, that's not really good for the brain. And the numbers now are that we really shouldn't have alcohol at all. And I say that from Texas, where we're still leading the nation in drinking uh, during and after COVID, and we don't see many, any signs of stopping. But if you've noticed your drinking went up, try to get your drinking to come back down because it really is not good for your brain. Everybody with dementia falls, Jamie, and, and what is so aggravating is nobody tells the family this, and so when falls happen, families think somebody's doing something wrong. The way a person falls is actually a clue to the amount of brain damage they have, but it's also a clue to the type of dementia they have. In the beginning, a person with Alzheimer's tends to fall backwards into their chair, and because they landed on the chair, on the couch, on the sofa, we don't even notice that there was a fall. Eventually, they'll have enough brain damage that they will begin to fall the way a person with vascular dementia falls. And that person stands, their blood pressure doesn't acclimate quickly enough, and they come forward out of the chair, landing on their faces, their elbows, and their knees. Parkinson's disease dementia has now been pulled under the Lewy body umbrella. It's actually considered a variant of Lewy bodies. And Lewy body and Parkinson's people fall in a very unique way called planking. They suddenly stiffen like a board and fall forward landing on the front of their faces or they fall backwards hitting the crown of their head. And the fall is very unique. It's very stiff 
it's called a plank because they're like a board plank and it's due to a sudden loss of consciousness that's not related to blood pressure so we really don't understand this one there are three categories of frontal temporal dementias there are the behavioral sexual ones the communication disorders and the movement disorders the movement disorder people are going to be cared for in a skilled setting because they are licensed to have a piece of equipment called a Hoyer lift. But the behavioral dementias of FTD and the speech dementias of FTD cause the person to begin to bend halfway. Now your brain, your full brain weighs three pounds, but your head weighs 20 to 25 pounds based on how big you are. And once the head begins to move forward, the shoulders roll and follow and so this person goes from walking straight up like this to slowly being bent to where their head is causing them to be very out of balance. So they are one of our biggest uh, fall risk that we have. And they may have 30 head falls a day that involve strikes to the head. And you can't put a helmet on them. That makes them more out of balance and they take the helmet off. When Eric Korsakoff, it depends on how long they abused alcohol. They may fall in any direction. One of the forms of Huntington is Huntington's chorea with a CH. It actually means the limbs are jerking, so they fall in every direction. And one of the forms of chronic traumatic encephalopathy is a movement disorder. So we know that these men fall. We just don't have that much information yet on them. Now, the reason this is in here, Jamie, is because I've had families who were convinced that their loved ones falling or inability to walk was really just the result of them being lazy and not trying hard enough. And what you need to finish today with is understanding this disease, regardless of which one it is, if they live long enough, destroys the motor cortex, which is here, the premotor cortex here, the limbic system through here, basal ganglia back here, and those are all the sy systems that you have to have to be able to lift and move your body. Everything is destroyed by the disease, and that's why people become chair-bound and then bed-bound. It's not poor care. It's not a lack of trying. It's not somebody who needs physical therapy. It's brain damage. You've also got to prepare yourself for broken hips. Broken hips occur in stage six when there is so much brain damage, and you've got to realize we've been saying it to you wrong. Your mother didn't fall and break her hip. Your mother stood turned, broke her hip, and then she fell. And so part of this is our fault for saying it wrong, but your mother's hip broke because the brain is now too damaged to maintain the skeletal structure. It means the end of life is coming. It doesn't mean your mother's been getting poor care. It's a common thing for us to expect, anticipate, and plan for in stage six of the disease. Your loved one develops urinary tract infections. And Jamie, this is something that just makes families think we really, really are confused about what we're doing. And what families don't understand is they're part of the disease of dementia because the brain runs the body. And when the parietal lobe gets damaged enough, it's not able to raise the body's temperature to fight infection, which is the point of having a fever is to kill infection. And it's not able to send T cells, white cells, fight cells to go attack infection. And so the UTIs will begin to happen faster and faster and faster and faster. Now, Jamie, I remember the first time I was uh, at work at, at a skilled facility. I spent five years at a, at a skilled facility as a social worker. And then I spent 10 years in facilities as a gerontologist. The first time I ran into this, I was astonished. What happened was the person with dementia developed a urinary tract infection and a nurse or an ER doctor told the family that the urinary tract infection happened because the community did not change their loved one's adult incontinent product. And so this is sort of how you have to think of that. Wet incontinent products, what you and I were grew up calling diapers, don't cause urinary tract infections to happen in little kids. That doesn't cause urinary tract infections to happen in people who might have them on right now while they're watching this. And it doesn't cause urinary tract infections in people with dementia. It is happening because of brain damage. And the more damaged the brain becomes, 
the more frequently the urinary tract infections happen until by the end of the disease, they're coming one right after the other. And there's usually about a two day period where the person's urine test clear and then they'll be sick again. Now this comes from the medical grand rounds of 1984 and this is considered the gold standard. And if you'll notice on the side in red, is a nurse's mnemonic that spells out diapers. And you'll notice, Jamie, nurses can't spell. There's one too many P's in there. And um, I just like to say that for the nurses that are listening. So what this says is delirium causes urinary tract infections and urinary tract infections cause delirium. Urinary tract infections are actually a symptom of dementia, especially late stage dementia. Women have a greater risk because we lose fluid naturally through thinning vaginal walls. We give people heart medications that make them lose fluid. We can have people with dementia who are so depressed, even if we put the drink right in front of them, they're not going to drink it because if they drink it, they have to go pee. And if I have to go pee, I have to ask for help. And there's a group of people whose entire culture does not involve asking for help. And can you guess, Jamie, what country that might be? <laughs> so Americans don't ask for help. Texans don't ask for help. Whatever state you're in, y'all are proud of, you don't ask for help. And that's why it's so critical that the Anthem Memory Care staff know your loved one and make friends and alliances and relationships with them because it helps that person to take that drink. We give people with dementia pills that make them pee. And even people with brain damage figure out that nurse is giving me something that makes me pee 30 times a day. I'm not going to ask for help. I'm just going to stop drinking. Restricted mobility, and that is anything other than an open regular gait. And then histories of stool impaction or constipation. And remember, Parkinson's and Lewy body both have constipation as part of their disease. It's not related to medicine or diet. It's part of their brain disease. So all of these things affect whether or not your loved one has UTIs and how frequently they will have them, and it's driven by brain damage. But you'll notice nowhere on here does it say wet diaper, and that's because a wet diaper does not cause a UTI. The last question for families, and, and this is really the elephant in the room. Jamie, and you've seen this. Chris, you've seen this. Chris, I think this is part of what drove you into this business in a big, big way is the amount of guilt that families feel. You feel guilty because you're on this call right now. You may feel guilty because you're learning about dementia right now. You may feel guilty because you're having to think about taking away your loved one's independence. And that guilt can make you feel many, many different things, especially when you're getting criticism and feedback from family members who've never spent one minute in your shoes. And so as professionals, we have to always remind you, your loved one's going to get care one way or the other. It's you. And can we save you? And can we help you? And in doing that, also help your loved one. The numbers after COVID show that three out of 10 family caregivers die before the person with the terminal brain disease dies. And that's unacceptable. Family caregivers have depression and family caregivers and it can be because of the generation that, that we're in. You may have been taught that depression is not a real disease, that it's just people being lazy who need to get up and work harder. And you need to understand depression is a real disease. It's caused by an, an inability of the brain to correctly use or produce serotonin. And Jamie, it's now been released that untreated depression in about 10 years seems to become Alzheimer's. And that connection has not been made, but it certainly scares me. So you've got to be able to be realistic about how you feel for thinking about your loved one's care and for getting ready to provide care for them. Now, these are two brains and they're actually sort of famous. This was done by the North Carolina Alzheimer's Association several years ago. These are both men. They were both 72 years old. They had the same college degree. They even worked in the same industry, but one aged normally and one did not. And this is why your loved one's answers are not correct. That's why all of the tools that we use in dementia are observational tools because we can't trust a person with brain damage to tell us the correct answer, not because they're mean, Jamie, but because they have brain damage. 
This is why they are confused in the world around them. And, and you have to remember, one of the things that I hear families say is they say, well, I asked mom and she doesn't want to move yet. You know, Jamie, we don't ask five-year-old children, do you want to get up for the next 12 years early, early, early in the morning and go to school? And we don't ask people with dementia, do you want to move out of this environment that you're in and go to another one? We make a medical decision about their care. This is why a person with dementia says whatever they think. We always tell somebody, if you want to know, does this dress make me look good or bad? Put it on and go to a dementia community and they will gladly tell you, you look terrible. And this is why they can't communicate with us properly. Everything the person with dementia is doing is directly related back to the area of the brain that's damaged or the area of the brain that is still available to function. So that is five questions that you need to know the answer to. And everybody needs to probably go get their cubes of ice now and cling on to them real tightly. And then does anybody have any questions? Well, that's how good of a job I did. Nobody had any questions. And that's not unusual, Chris. You and Jamie should know that. I have a question. Absolutely. Can you hear me? OK, yes. you made a you made a surprising statement to me that um, um, was kind of encouraging. Uh, I think you said something like constipation is caused by the dementia, not by the diet. Now, we've yeah. been taught by our medical community that um, uh, the dementia is slowing down. The um, passing the stool out um, is caused by a diet. So could you refer to that some more? Because we've been really struggling with this whole diet thing because I'm the caregiver now and I'm not used to cooking. And uh, it'd be a whole lot easier if I could cook regular meals, but I haven't been cooking regular meals and that's been pretty hard. So um, yeah, what, what I said was in Lewy body dementias and in Parkinson's disease dementia, both of those dementias have constipation as part of the disease. It's not related to medication and it's not related to diet. For other people, people with dementia, it's not unusual to go into a community and first thing in the morning find uh, prune juice being used because you want to use something natural first. Um, warm things to drink act as something that will help the bowels move. As a rule of thumb, uh, we call it the 90 second rule, 90 seconds after I finish a meal, my bladder needs to empty. 30 minutes after I finish a meal, my bowel needs to empty. But as the disease progresses and because people who are older are on more medicines, um, in some states, for example, the average person in a skilled facility is on 28 medicines. The average person in memory care is on 19. So you run into polypharmacy. So one of the things to do is take a list of your loved one's medications to the pharmacist. They have a program in their system that will allow them to put in the medications and see if you have anything that is interfering with your loved one. And then it's also not uncommon in memory care that we have a lot of residents that have prune juice in the morning and also have Miralax or other forms of uh, fiber throughout the day to help their system keep working as best as it can. Thank you. And uh, I have uh, Diane, you have a question here. Let me get you. Yes, thank you. Um, the the thing about the nine dimensions was in ruling out different things was very helpful. Um, my husband has like no short term memory. Um, some it seems like language processing um, things, but he's been seeing a neurologist since 2015, and the neurologist still calls it mild cognitive impairment. Um, and it's, he said that he wouldn't call it dementia until he can't do some of his ADLs. And that's not you, true, ma'am. Yeah, fact, I mean, you've got a you've got a neurologist who's not a dementia specialist. And what most people don't realize is neurologists aren't dementia specialists unless they are. Most neurologists have no interest in dementia. They don't study it. It's not part of the course of study for neurology. It is a specialty. And so um, you can go to uh, tamcummings.com, 
look on the dementia behavioral assessment tool, start in stage four and begin to check off every behavior you see, and that will tell you what stage your loved one is in. But there that uh, the other thing is go to the Bristol ADL scale that's also on my website. And Chris, you guys can have these tools for your website too. They're all in the public domain. Um, it's just that I use them because I'm a gerontologist, but they allow the family to take better information to the doctor. So the ADL scale, your neurologist, the ADL scale your neurologist is using was made by Dr. Katz in 1952 for normal aging. And a person with dementia has to be almost bed bound before they begin to fail everything. Instead, use the Bristol tool. And it was made by the Bristol Medical School of Bristol, England. Hence, it's the Bristol ADL scale. It was built for people with dementia. And then look for somebody who's a specialist in dementia because the neurologist you're seeing is not. Okay, thank you. Um, and it, if I can add, Diane, if you'll reach out to your closest Anthem Memory Care community, our community relations director will help you locate um, the local testing sites in your area, often uh, affiliated with university schools of medicine. Um, we, we should have lists of those available to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I've got to go to dentist. And I, I don't know if y'all if y'all got this yet, Jamie, but Texas made a thing called the Texas Best Practices Model for diagnosing uh, dementias like Alzheimer's. I think that may be the type. But um, it and it was created because we're such a rural state that it was designed that you could take it to any physician. And if they simply followed the steps and the guidelines, they could make the proper dementia diagnosis by doing the proper test. And I think I might have sent it to y'all, but if I haven't, it is a wonderful tool for families because it allows you to see these are the tests the doctor should be doing. And some of these are tests that you yourself can do to prepare for the doctor. So you can do the Bristol ADL scale to get ready for the doctor. You can give your loved one the slums test. So there are several things you can do to get ready. And if I haven't sent that to you already, uh, Jamie, I'll get that out to y'all when we hang up. That'd be great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Steve, you had a question? Well, some, some of it's been answered now. Um, I, I have a, a stubborn, paranoid parent that's been falling you know, on his knees and is now chair bound his 24 hour care at home. But I think that he needs um, perhaps or soon will need a facility. But um, with his paranoia, he won't um, even sign a power of attorney now. And I think I need testing to assist with you know future guardianship but part of this challenge is you know who's going to do the testing and who's going to come into the home to do it because i can't pry him out of there unless there's a, a reason an emergency that he has to be taken out of there you know you can notify in each one of your states adult protective services for help with some of the things that you're describing and they can okay. start a file uh, you can make it an anonymous call to them. They're going to want your parents' name and address and phone number and date of birth and everything you know about them. But you can tell them you're making it anonymously and they'll give you a code that you can call back and check on what, what was the result of, of their um, investigation. But Adult Protective Services is there to help families. And that may be your first start. Uh, I also, I'm, I might be able to have an um, actual physician visit them in the home. And I was wondering if I did some of these, um, like the Bristol, and he, he's already failed the slums twice when he was at a rehab um, in June. Oh, well, then he's then he's got dementia. It's just a determination yeah. now of which one. Right, but I, I mean, I, I still can't um, go to a court with, you know, trying for guardianship unless I've got, I think, a, a, an actual doctor that's, You'd need to talk to an elder law attorney, sir, because okay. it varies from state to state. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and maybe maybe I could contact Anthem too, or absolutely, please do, Steve. We'll try to uh -huh. assist you with a referral. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any other questions, Dr. Tam? Yeah, could I ask another one about the the diet? Um, 
what um, what we've been told is to do a gastroparesis diet, which is uh, just the opposite of what's normally a, a healthy diet. You know, no um, no salads or anything like that. So um, they're saying that that causes some of the the backup. And um, um, so, do you find that that's um, a factor with uh, Lewy body uh, disease, or is it pretty much predominantly? Uh, it's just the disease itself, and it's not that I need to do um, uh, a gastroparesis diet, just the soft foods. Well, you can have, normally when we move to, to soft foods, it's because the person is no longer able to chew and swallow food correctly. Um, and I'm not sure that your person has been diagnosed with, with Lewy bodies. but She has we, been. Okay, we sort of operate under the guidelines of this person has a terminal brain disease, what's going to make them happiest? And in her case, with the dietary stuff, you may need more nutritional or dietary guidelines, and Jamie could probably help y'all help you on stuff like that uh, as to a referral source in your area, because I'm not sure where you are. Uh, but you you really are looking for what makes this person happiest? And how can you achieve that? Because she's dying, and what would she ask you to do? I mean, mm. my my dying is you better be feeding me chocolate every <laughs> day if I if I get this. I've got it set up with multiple people. Feed me chocolate. Mm. But it's um, what can you do to keep your wife as comfortable and as as happy and as pleasant as possible? And so it may be that you need to talk to a nutritionist. Uh, have your doctor refer you to a nutritionist, but the person needs to understand Lewy bodies. So go to NIH.gov. That's the National Institutes of Health.gov. That's the repository of research. If you will go on to the search bar, type in Lewy body dementia family handbook, and you should get about a 40 page PDF and you can either order the handbook and they're free. Jamie, I don't know if I've mentioned yeah. this, but they're Free. You ignore them by right. the case. The government will give them to you. But it's one of the best books on Lewy body dementia for families that I've ever seen. Mm. And it helps you with staging. It helps you with diet. It helps you talk to the physicians because she's very sensitive to medications. And things that might make Jamie eat like mad might make her do something completely opposite. Mm. So, um, also, go to lbda.org, which is Lewy Body Dementia Association. So, go to lbda.org and look on their website and see what you can find there for diet information. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Good luck to you. Thanks. And uh, Christy, you have a question. Christy had a question, then she realized I've depressed her so much she forgot her question. She, she, you, she is on mute. Christy, if you don't know um, where to find the unmute, you can always type your question into the chat. So we'll circle back while she's doing that. And uh, Lynn has a question also. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Um, I was just wondering, Tim, if you could talk a little bit about vision. Is it that the individuals can see, but they're not processing? No, or they can't. The they can't see, processing? and they can't. Yeah, they can't see, and they can't process. So there's there's multiple things happening, and that's actually in our next session. We'll we'll talk about the five senses and what's happening. But basically, okay. it, it's this. First, there's the loss of peripheral vision. And, and you can see this because they turn their heads from side to side to see what's happening. Then it's like they're looking through a submarine, just through the periscope. And this you'll notice, and this will sound familiar to Jamie and Chris, they'll reach across the table for someone else's food, something they've never done before. And then vision becomes binocular, and they are only seeing these tunnels. They've lost all of the visual field around them. And then for some of them in stage six, they'll develop what is called occipital blindness. They'll lose vision in this eye, not because the eye itself is damaged, but because of brain damage in the right occipital lobe. 
and they'll actually only see a small tunnel through here. The other thing is before the, sub, the uh, binocular, before the submarine starts, they can have something right in front of them and not be able to see it. So vision, it's, and it's not a measure, matter of they need glasses, it's brain damage. And so, yes, there are serious visual things that occur. And if they've already got a vision problem like macular degeneration or glaucoma, it, it's just that much more difficult for that person. Okay, thank you. And there's a question in the chat. And um, I can't Chris, see that. I'll, I'll read it to you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, mom was in a, a facility on hospice. Uh, nurse had asked if I wanted to administer morphine. I said she is still eating. I just can't. Is she done? Um, they have her in a burly chair. Some days she is frozen and cannot speak. Some days she can eat and talk. Um, it, it's fine for them to start morphine. They're not going to kill her. She's not going to get addicted to it. What happens is when you enter into that final part of actively dying, it can feel like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. It feels very constricted. And all the morphine does is it relaxes that chest wall and allows the person to breathe without feeling that constriction. So they're not going to give enough to hurt her and it doesn't mean death is imminent. It's just a way to make your mother more comfortable. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm amazed, Chris. I usually have depressed people so much that they don't say anything. This group has been very, very good. This has been this yeah. has been a, this has been a great, great group, and 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 thank you so much, Tam. It's just such powerful um, information, and I know um, everybody got something um, out of this out of this session. And I know they're only obviously going to continue uh, as we we move on uh, through this series. So. Um, everyone, please take note that our next session uh, with Dr. Cam uh, will be Wednesday, December 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Um, and we will be learning about the functioning of the lobes of the brain and the impact uh, dementia has on these lobes. So if, if you're not already receiving um, invitations to webinars and you want to join um, our invite list, uh, contact your local Anthem community. Uh, if you do not, do not know where to find an Anthem community, please go to um, AnthemMemoryCare.com for a complete listing. And with that, that wraps up our first session with Dr. Tam. I want to let's thank uh, Dr. Tam and appreciate everyone in your time. And we look forward to seeing you guys on our next webinar. Thank you so thank much, Tam. We sure appreciate oh, it. Thank you all. Thank y'all and everybody out there. Y'all take care of yourselves. You're all doing a great job. You really go are. get your ice you. when you need it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Ice. Thank you so much. Tam. Everybody take care. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye bye.